I really like Rode products. I bought quite a few of them over the years, from their OG video mic to their Filmmaker wireless lav system, their NTG4 Plus shotgun mic, and how even the normal lav mic that I'd be using to record these videos is a Rode one. So when Rode reached out and asked if I wanted to take a look at their new Rode X products, specifically this XDM100 dynamic mic, I was incredibly excited to try it out. They even tried to sweeten the deal with a pair of their NTH100 over-ear headphones, which are very nice, and even their frankly amazing PSA OnePlus mic stand, and actually even a box of what you might call swag, like, um, well, this Rodex beanie. Despite all of this, though, I'm feeling a little let down with the mic. Let me explain, and take this off first. Right, that's better. The XDM100 uses a dynamic capsule with a cardioid pickup pattern. It's good for 20 to 20,000 hertz, and since it is a USB mic, it has an onboard amp and ADC, which runs at 48 kilohertz when with 24 bits of data per sample. That's all pretty standard, pretty good, but fairly standard as is the I.O., with the USB port sticking straight out the bottom, and the 3.5mm jack, which sits either on the back or the front, depending on how you look at that, next to the headphone volume dial. You've also got a little LED to show you if the headphones are muted or not on the opposite side. In the box, you get the mic, a very premium-feeling pop filter sock, an equally premium USB-C to C cable, and one of their fancy screw-in 3.5mm jack cables. No, you can't screw it into the mic though, uh, it's also just an extension, and there's also no USB-C to A adapter in the box, so I hope you either have one on your system or have an adapter already, because, well, the system I'm using right now doesn't have a USB-C port, so I am using an adapter that I had already. The single biggest feature that Rode are promoting with these new mics is their Unify software. This is their attempt at making a, a complete audio solution for streaming, acting as a, a virtual mixer, much like Elgato's Wavelink software does. Now, despite using uh, a, an Elgato Wave 3 for my streams, I actually don't bother using the Wavelink software, so I would say that I'm already predisposed to not liking Rode's version of this either. With that said, Rode has added some pretty useful features, like a soundboard uh, or effects board built in. In fact, you can hear, here's a, a cat. There you go. Um, but, uh, and it's overall a very similar experience to something like the Wavelink software, but there are a few quirks. If you choose not to monitor the audio through the built-in 3.5mm jack, which I'll talk more about in a minute, the monitor audio is noticeably delayed. It's just enough to have a speech jamming effect on me, hence I don't even have some headphones on right now listening to how this sounds, uh, and if you want to make that uh, happen at all though, you'll need to work out the interface, which, well, it's a little bit difficult to do. First of all, you have to work out that the little mute icon in the bottom right is actually a mute icon, and that needs to be not enabled, and you'll need to work out which of the list of options is the one that'll actually get you monitor audio back out. It took me a while to work that one out. And on the note of unclear UI design, if you happen to accidentally click on the image of the mic or any of the audio sound sources, it brings up a pretty much hidden menu where you can control gain, a high pass filter, and features like noise gate, compressor, aural exciter, and big bottom. The last two are uh, road specific features and, well, the, they say that it gives you a, a classic, rich, broadcast tone. Um, here is what that sounds like with those features on. I'll let you make up your own mind how that sounds or if it's any better or not. But one thing I do know is that a lot of these features are not clear to new users. Having never used this software before, I had to watch videos from Rode to get any clue for how to use it. And even then, I still had to work some things out for myself. I wouldn't exactly call it a plug-and-play experience. And there's also one minor issue, which is that if any other applications try and use the .audio devices you've assigned in the Unify software, they'll break, because Unify wholly occupies a device. 
all audio has to be routed through Unify, full stop. Earlier I mentioned the headphone jack and not wanting to use it. Obviously, if you already use some USB headphones, speakers, or especially wireless headphones, well, you're not going to be using that. But even if you did want to use it with, say, the very nice NTH100 headphones they sent along with the mic, well, this is what I hear when I try and use those headphones. That noise may be coming from the very large phone tower that's under 100 meters from my house, but it's worth noting that no other mics that I have here have that issue. In fact, what I'd argue is the XDM100's main competitor, the Shure MV7, well, I just happen to have that here, and it's recording at the same time, and that doesn't have that issue at all. Now, as you've probably already heard, that sound, that noise, doesn't get translated into the output source that you're hearing, but it's painfully loud in the headphones and it makes it unusable as a monitor source, which again, doesn't happen with the headphone jack on the Shure MV7. Also, to critique the hardware design a little bit, well, this thing feels like, it's built like a tank, there are definitely some questionable design choices. First, the output control dial in theory can mute the mic by clicking it down, but only if you're using the Unify software. That is a pretty weird choice, as if you just want to use this straight into OBS, maybe in a on a system you haven't set the Unify software up with yet, or maybe it's just not running. Well, just pressing that button only mutes the headphone audio, not the recorded audio. It's also not a capacitive button, making it a clunky and noisy experience for you and your viewers. And second is the dial and jack itself. Now, Rode says that that should be the front of the mic, i.e. what should be facing you, which is fine. It's not ideal having the mic jack sticking straight out at you, but okay, fine, whatever. So why is the mic mute LED on the opposite side? I mean, it's actually worse than that because if you use this included pop filter sock, it actually covers the LED so that that LED is only visible from straight on. So which side is actually the front here? And when it comes to the USB ports, well, I'm not a fan of a port like that just sticking straight out the bottom. This is designed to go on a, a stand that you can move around and, well, if you aren't careful, you can ram the very protruding cable into your desk and just snap it right off or damage the port. There's no support built in. It's not a recessed port where there's some mechanical support, you know, on the, the cable itself. It's not even a right angle connector on the USB cable, which would arguably make a lot more sense. Equally, the fact that the USB port is separated from the headphone jack is also a bit annoying, meaning you have to have two cables spurting out of different locations on the mic, and neither are what I would call pretty. To give my thoughts on the sound quality, I do like how this sounds. It has a pretty clean, rather quality feel to it, and the, the broadcaster features are pretty nice too. Definitely giving it a, a more professional feel, and compared to the MV7, I would say that while they do have some slight differences in their tone, quality, and how they pick up certain, you know, the, the plosive P's or the, the sort of whistling from uh, my, my teeth arrangements, I would say that uh, at, the, sort of at the end of things, they offer a very similar sort of final experience. They both offer pretty top-notch quality that wouldn't be out of place on a pro streamer or podcaster's desk, but the MV7 does have a few extra tricks up its sleeve, like a capacitive mute button and XLR support, making it arguably more versatile compared to the XDM100. At the time of filming, it's also like £200 versus £270 for the XDM, so I think I know which one I would prefer. With that said, those are my thoughts, but I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. What do you think of the XDM100 and the comparison to the MV7? Out of these two, which one would you pick? And would you pick either of these? Would you go with the cheaper Rode XCM50 or something like the Elgato Wave mics? Or are you just sticking with, you know, your, your headset mic, a, a mod mic, something like that instead? Feel free to let me know in the comments down below. If you want to check out the XDM100 or the MV7, 
27. I'll, both, I'll leave links to both of them in the description if you want to check them out. And that's kind of it. If you want to see more reviews like this one, maybe go check out the MV7 review as this isn't a perfect mic either. I definitely had some, you know, quirks and features with this too, so maybe check that one out. And uh, yeah, otherwise feel free to support the channel with the links in the description, become a YouTube member or a Patreon if you fancy, pick up a hoodie or t-shirt like this one or a load of other designs I made myself, and of course check out plenty of other videos on the end cards as well. Otherwise, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it, we'll see you on the next video.